Hello everyone, Mr. Robbins again to continue and finish up our discussion of the American Revolution. And so today in this video we'll actually get into the nitty gritty of the revolution um, and kind of the battles that are important. And then of course, for our purposes, what the outcomes of it are. I uh, won't spoil it yet, uh, but maybe you have an idea what the outcome will be. Uh, and uh, kind of talk about how it breaks down and kind of moving forward what the United States will look like later. Oh, no, I spoiled it. Dang it. Okay. Well, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so this image gives you kind of an idea about how colonial attitudes may have been changing towards Great Britain by July 1776. So if you take a look at this, you could kind of see what's going on. Maybe you cannot... Uh, figure out who this is supposed to be up here, but maybe you see what that, that's what's on his head. But if not, maybe you see the, the writing down here, right? So, King George III statue being torn down by colonists. Is that something that we would have seen at the beginning of Unit 2? Probably not, but now we are. Um, and there is a clear reason for that. It was all that stuff that led up to this, the road to revolution, that now by July 1776, the colonists are done trying to negotiate and now really want independence. But when I talk about the colonists, that is a weird term to use because the reality is, is that there are differences of opinion amongst the colonists. Um, and really by 1776, there are three groups that are not quite equally divided, but three groups that there are large portions uh, by themselves of the colonial population. Now, the first group is one that we introduced last time, the Patriots, okay? These are folks that do want independence with Great Britain, to separate with Great Britain once and for all, okay? So these are the folks that, when we kind of think about the colonists in this period, we think they're all Patriots, they all want independence. But that's not necessarily true, because there's a, a, a fairly large group of folks that we would call loyalists. These are folks who... Maybe they have some criticisms of the British Empire. Maybe they have some criticisms of how they did things, but they do not want to leave the British Empire. They want to stay British colonies. And then there's a large group of folks that we'll call neutrals who are in the middle. They're undecided. They really don't know about what side to choose. They kind of see the both sides, and you know, they're kind of in the middle. They're like, I don't know what to choose. Okay, Now, when we get to 1776, this is basically what the breakdown is. Okay, you got about 40% of the American population straight up patriots wanting independence. Then you got about 20% of the population, so a smaller group, but still sizable of folks who want to just be loyalist and stay in the uh, Great Britain and stay in the British Empire. And then that last group, the neutrals, that 40%, they're the ones that could really go either way. Okay, so if most of them go to the loyalists, well, guess what? That's going to be the bigger group. But if just some of them start going to the Patriots, that's going to make a majority group, okay? And so it's really persuading those folks in the middle to be like, hey, perhaps independence ought to be pursued. Now, by July of 1776, there had been at least enough of those Patriots in all of the 13 colonies that by the time of the meeting of the Second Continental Congress, so this is the second meeting of, of all the colonies together, uh, they meet together in Philadelphia, and they meet, and by that point, it's pretty clear independence is probably the road to go down. And so once it becomes clear to this group that that might be what's going to happen, they say, okay, well, we're definitely not going to declare independence without clearly saying why we're doing it. So we need to write down our reasons. So they get together a five-man committee to draft what would become the Declaration of Independence. Now, the number one most important guy for the Declaration of Independence will be Thomas Jefferson. Now, Jefferson uh, was a representative of the Continental Congress from the state of Virginia. Uh, he was a very ardent patriot, very much on the side of independence, uh, but also really uh, kind of bright, well-spoken, well-written. He could write really well. And so they chose him because they thought he might be the best to get the words down on paper. It wasn't just him, but other folks uh, did help, and we'll talk about a couple of them in a moment. Now, 
The thing is, though, is that to say that the Declaration of Independence is totally original is not quite true, because a lot of the ideas that show up in the Declaration are straight up kind of taken and maybe not, you know, plagiarized or whatever or copied and pasted, but they're very, very similar to some of the Enlightenment ideals that we talked about at the end of the last video. Okay, so uh, the ideas of John Locke, particularly, okay, the ideas of natural rights, they're all in there as kind of part of the explanation of, hey, this is why the colonists are rebelling, this is why we want independence, okay? Now, in his writing, John Locke's writing, okay, he talked about the natural rights being life, liberty, and property, okay? And that's close to what Jefferson puts in there, but that's not quite it, okay? Instead, he says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because he didn't want to make everyone think they had a right to property. But we also have ideas in there like the social contract theory, okay? And uh, in the independence, it directly says that, you know, when a tyrant, you know, um, hurts their people, well, the people have the power to take power back from that king, that tyrant, and make their own government. Now, the Committee of Five was not just Thomas Jefferson, okay? So in this picture, you have, uh, there's Jefferson, okay? But you also had Ben Franklin, who we talked about, um, who was also a, a delegate to the Continental Congress. John Adams from Massachusetts, uh, who had kind of come along to being a patriot in recent years, along with two other guys, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. But really, the one who writes most of it is going to be Jefferson, and the other guys kind of help him edit it. Now, this famous image um, is supposed to show the moment where uh, the in Declaration of Independence was signed at the Second Continental Congress. Um, the, the thing is, is that this is not the way it happened, because, number one, never at any point were like all the dudes in there at the same time. OK, um, that never happened. Um, but all the guys who signed it, you can see them here. And I don't have this image with me, but there's like a little key that goes with it um, that kind of shows all the peoples that have their different signatures on there. Um, but it is a cool image. If you ever go to the Congress building in D.C., you would see this up in the rotunda. And it's really, really big. It's a really, really big pic, uh, painting. Um, it's cool to look at, just not historically accurate. Now, the thing is, is that the Declaration of Independence is us formally demanding separation, okay? It is the first time the colonists are saying, we do not want to be part of the British Empire, and this uh, assembly that we brought together is saying that, okay? But the reality is, when we start talking about the war, the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War, it doesn't start in 1776. It had already started. Uh, with the battles of Lexington and Concord in 1775. And in the time in between Lexington and Concord in April of 1775 and the signing of, a declaration of, of, of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, um, there had already been the formation of a Continental Army under uh, General George Washington uh, from Virginia, who, again, probably a name you recognize. And the division between the Patriots, Loyalists, and Neutrals had already started to occur. So the Inde Declaration of Independence is more of a reflection of what the things had already happened than kind of saying, hey, now we're going to declare independence and now things are really going to get started. No, things had already gotten started. Now, to kind of talk a little bit more about this Patriot and Loyalist divide, I got two guys here kind of to exp uh, kind of be examples of both sides, okay? Now, on the Patriot side, a uh, well-known Revolutionary War general, Nathaniel Green, uh, he was a pa pacifist. He was part of the Quaker religion uh, that we talked about back in Unit 1, who generally Quakers are pacifists, meaning they don't want to fight in wars, but Green is an exception because he did sign up to fight and lead men in the Revolution. And he said, quote, I'm determined to defend my rights and maintain my freedom or sell my life in the attempt. So... You know, give me freedom or give me death, as some other folks put it at that time. Now, on the other hand, you have the Loyalists here, okay? This is a loy uh, guy named Charles English. Uh, he is a clergyman, a member of the Church of England. 
but he's a colonial. He lives in the colonies, all right? Uh, but as a member of the Church of England, probably not a huge surprise that he would be more loyal to England, okay? And he says, by a reconciliation, a kind of mending offenses with Britain, an end would be brought to the present calamitous or disastrous war by which many lives have been lost and so many more must be lost if it continues. Now we see that both of these guys have kind of a point, right? Uh, but, of course, the side that we're going to be more sympathetic to will be the Patriot side because they're the ones that are actually going to be fighting this revolutionary war. Now, the thing is, is that even though we know the outcome of this conflict, we really need to talk about what the advantages and disadvantages were at the beginning of the war. And simply put, the British had all the advantages, or most of the advantages, I should say. When we look at the size of their army, the, the Redcoat Army, they were 400 times larger than the American army. They were certainly more experienced. Most of their fighters are going to be professional soldiers, meaning like it's their job to fight, right? So they know how to use their weaponry. They know how to march. They know how to, you know, be tough in the face of, you know, threats from the enemy. Obviously, the British Empire is going to have more money than the American colonies will. That should be pretty obvious. Um, the British also have, by this point in history, the world's most dominant navy, which was true then in 1776 and would be true for basically the next hundred uh, plus years. Um, and then finally, manufacturing. Most manufacturing for both Britain, Britain and uh, their colonies in the empire happened in Great Britain, in the British Isles. So... They had more gun manufacturers. They had more, you know, uniform manufacturers, boot manufacturers, and things like that that the colonists just did not have as much access to, okay? But there are some clear advantages on the colonist side that are the reasons why they eventually won, okay? Um, one, a familiarity with the environment. Uh, the fact is, is the Redcoats will be fighting in terrain they do not know very well, very heavily wooded, um, easy to kind of get lost in, unless you know the area like many of the colonists did. Um, the colonists generally have short supply lines to their soldiers. So while they might not have access to all the guns and you know clothing and all the things that an army needs to the same level the British, the reality is, is that the British... They have to get those things from either Canada or all the way back in England. And so that meant that it took a lot longer for them to get the stuff, whereas the Americans had less stuff, but it could get to them a lot quicker because of where they were located. We also see that the American strategy is a little different than the British strategy, where it's a defensive one. They're not trying to defeat Great Britain or invade London or whatever. They're just trying to defend themselves long enough for the British to give up. And that's a big part of this, right? Because the thing that the British really underestimate is the Americans' commitment to win. The, the Americans are going to go through tremendous hardship during this war. And a lot of the British thought that would be enough to get them to stop rebelling. But it's not. They keep going and going and going to try and outlast the British, which is their ultimate goal. But the English... To win, they have to be on the offensive. They can't just wait. They have to go and defeat the entire Continental Army, which is easier said than done, especially if you have a commander like Washington who knows this is what they have to do and is trying to prevent it however he can. Now, George Washington is a pivotal figure in the American Revolution uh, for many, many reasons, and so this is just a few. Okay, One is that he had to make his army from scratch, okay? The British had the Redcoats. They had a professional army. The Americans had nothing like that, okay? So he had to make the Continental Army from scratch. He even had to design the uniforms and all these things, come up with the training, all mostly by himself, but with some other help. But not just that. A large part of the fighting force for the Americans were militias. So not professional army troops, but guys who kind of organized themselves into these military units that would go out and fight in, generally in their local area, okay? Now, 
The other thing, though, that Washington has to do is kind of be a, uh, a like a motivator, okay, like an inspiration, because regular folks in the many times in this war, many regular colonists were were kind of you know like, listen, this is tough. Maybe we should give up, okay. Um, and especially early on in the war, it seems like this is hopeless. Like there's no way the Americans could win. So a lot of folks are like, why are we even fighting? Because it will be a lot of damage and hurt to us. But Washington's ever to, able to be pretty crafty and is able to kind of make ends meet and make it work until they get to a point where they do get some more help and the tide really starts to turn in the Americans' favor. Now, to kind of break down this talk about what the military looks for the Americans, I got a, a few images here for you guys. So the, there really are three different kinds of military men during this war, okay? So you have the Continental Army. That's going to be the main dudes. So these are the professional soldiers. These are the guys that signed up to be soldiers, and they're going to march all throughout the 13 colonies uh, throughout this war. The, then you also have these colonial militias, and that's what we have pictured here. Now, these colonial militias, as you can tell, you know, they're not wearing a uniform. Like, this guy's wearing blue, this guy's got red, you know, they, they got different clothes on. The rifles they have are probably their own rifles, so no one gave them to them. They just, that's the rifle they use to go hunting or whatever they need to do with that. Uh, but they're fighting on behalf of the colonists and on the, the side of the patriots. And then you even have civilians uh, so you have women. Uh, you have women that are going to fight on behalf of the revolution. You have some uh, uh, African Americans that fight on behalf of the American Revolution, although not usually as a member of civilian uh, militias or the Continental Army. But on the flip side, you also have African Americans and women and other civilians that fight on the side of the British. Okay, There you go. There's an image of women fighting. Uh, loading a cannon. Pretty crazy. Now, to say, though, that it was an easy task for Washington really would not be true, because this was the toughest test of his whole life. Uh, because the army is in a tough place. They don't generally, throughout the war, have enough clothes for all their men. They don't generally, throughout the war, have enough food for their men. Uh, at many times in the war... Um, Soldiers were forced to eat uh, what they called a hardtack, which was like basically they would take flour, uh, you know, to do baking. They would take the flour, mix it with water, and then like cook that in a pan and then like eat that. that that's kind of what they ate, which is not good, not good eats, okay? But that's what they had. That's all they had, okay? Um you also have situations where, you know, disease is really rampant. At multiple times, smallpox breaks out among the Continental Army, leaving a lot of folks sick, many dying, okay? Um, throughout the war, they don't have enough weaponry, they don't have enough guns, they don't have enough ammunition. Um, and then there's a big piece here that there are a lot of these soldiers, both in the Continental Army and then the militias also, who are they fighting and they're worried about their families because the British aren't only fighting against the soldiers, they're taking it out on the civilians. And so worrying about their families and if they're okay was a big, big thing that the Continental Army soldiers worried about. And so that's something that Washington had to worry about too. But nevertheless, Washington does keep this army together and they're able to win this war even despite of all these disadvantages. Now, a little bit more about civilians, though, okay? Because as we talked about, um, women, African Americans, and Native Americans play some role in this war as well, okay? Uh, on the side of the Patriots, uh, we see generally women, okay, uh, help to organize uh, supplies. So the supplies that they could get would kind of be ferried along to the Continental Army. They uh, often were still continuing those boycotts. Um, although by this time trade was really disruptive. Uh, so trying to get these guys whatever they could meant that a lot of times colonial patriot women were kind of making clothes and making boots in their homes that would get sent off to the soldiers on the front lines. Women, in many cases, operated as spies, okay, uh, who would kind of, you know, do the kind of um, reconnaissance and finding what's going on and kind of spread that information back to 
uh, military leaders. Uh, we see that uh, black folks, both enslaved and free blacks, will fight alongside the patriots, kind of in the hope to gain more rights within society. But the flip side is also true. We have cases, especially in the South, of enslaved blacks uh, fighting on the side of the on the side of the colonists in hopes they would get their freedom from uh, American uh, from from slavery, which happens to a few of them. Although, generally speaking, the the way that works out for them is that they are, if they're lucky enough, they get to come back on a British ship back to uh, England at the end of the war because, of course, the Americans will win. Um, the British, uh, on the other hand, have allies in the Native Americans. Most Native American tribes do ally with the British during this conflict, uh, mostly because of the fear of American encroachment. Uh, that proclamation line of 1763 was not perfect in any way, but with a British victory in this uh, war, perhaps the British would have more power to enforce that, which would make the area between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River more or less free for uh, Native Americans to live. Uh, so we see that by and large Native Americans do support the British and Loyalists in this. All right, so what are the military strategies? So we have George Washington, of course, representing the Americans. The uh, primary to start uh, British general was Thomas Gage, who we introduced a little bit in the Unit 2, Number 2 notes. Now, the American strategy is to outlast the British. Uh, again, it's a defensive strategy. They're defending colonial lands, but really just trying to drag the war out. They're not trying to have decisive battles with the British, because if they meet the British on the field of battle one too many times, the British, with their superior arms and more men, will probably beat them. Okay? So the idea is defend and maybe retreat Okay, when it was needed, not to try to force the big battle, but to live to fight another day. We also see that the Americans use many guerrilla tactics. Okay? Now, this was something that was seen for many of the colonists during the French and Indian War when fighting against the natives. The natives would use uh, the nature to kind of help them plant ambushes and kind of find places uh, that are remote that they could kind of surround the enemy and have a uh, geographic advantage. Well, the colonists will end up doing that to the British Redcoats since they know the terrain a lot better than the Redcoat generals did. Then finally, and this is really, really important, they needed to make an alliance with the French because the French, as the biggest enemy of the British in Europe, the French could help them out primarily with the use of the French Navy, which was not as big or strong as the British Navy, but it was certainly better than the American Navy, which was literally non-existent. The Americans didn't have any sort of Navy to talk about. Okay? Now, the British, though, they have a different strategy entirely. Okay? They are trying to conquer the Americans and defeat this revolution once and for all which means they have to do things a little differently, one of which would be divide and conquer. They find the loyalists in the colonies, the ones who are still loyal to them, many of them as members of the, the colonial governments, and they use their power to seize the property of patriots, uh, take, them, take their land, take their homes. And then the South especially, and we kinda, I just mentioned this, they encourage slave revolts to kind of get the slaves to rise up against slave owners in the South, uh, to kind of take away their power. The big strategy, especially in the middle part of the war for the British, is to split the northern and southern colonies, somewhere probably in Virginia, kind of keep them separated so they can't help each other and troops can't travel between, you know, the north and the south or send supplies between the north and the south. And the last one, and this is one that the British had a lot of advantages uh, because of their naval power, blockade ports, make it where nothing can come into the colonies, so eventually they would be starved of supplies, okay? But at the end of the day, the British strategy relied upon defeating the Continental Army and wiping them out, okay? Unless they could get Washington to surrender, they could not win. And as long as the Continental Army still existed, the war would continue. So again, while it might seem that, you know, hey, we want to take the fight to the British and get them out of here, in reality, what Washington's spending a lot of time doing is keeping the army together to fight another day 
because as long as his army's still together, the British can't declare victory. Now, we talked about this in uh, the Unit 2, Number 2 lecture, but again, the beginning of the war is that Lexington and Concord in April 1775. We won't talk a lot about that, but that really is the first battle of the American Revolution with the militias meeting the British Redcoats out there um, in near uh, both in Lexington, Massachusetts, and Concord, Massachusetts. But now moving forward, okay, we see that after uh, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, generally speaking, 1776 and 1777 were not good years for the Americans. And it seemed like at that point in history um, that the Americans were fighting a losing war as they lost both New York and Philadelphia, two of the biggest colonial cities in all of the 13 colonies. Um, and the British very famously go, when they take over New York, they burn most of it down. And until the end of the war, the British would continue to occupy New York City, uh, despite uh, American efforts to kind of kick them out. However, we do see that there are a few bright spots in these trying times, one of which happens after the capture of New York. Um, as the Americans are retreating to safer ground, they're leaving New York, okay, um, and they are heading out to uh, more safer environs away from the city, away from, you know, the big cities, and they're headed towards New Jersey and Trenton, New Jersey. As they approach the Delaware River, Washington and his men get word that there is a detachment of British soldiers and British mercenaries. The British hired several German uh, mercenaries from the state of Hesse, which is why we call them Hessians. Uh, these Hessians were, were mercenaries, so they're paid soldiers fighting on behalf of the British. And on Christmas Eve, Washington heard there was a large detachment of them in Trenton, New Jersey, hanging out and uh, drinking alcohol, getting drunk, having a good time. It's New Year's or it's Christmas Eve after all. And of course, no one's going to fight a battle on Christmas Eve, right? Wrong. So. Washington would lead his men uh, in a boat crossing across the Delaware where they're able to then surprise the tr British troops in Trenton and have a major uh, victory. Um, now, this victory is bigger because it was kind of a moral victory. It was like, hey, look, we can really win against the British than it was something that really harmed the British's war effort. But it definitely was something that raised the spirits of both the Continental Army and colonists. Now, this famous image, uh, this uh, painting, is not from this time. It's from the 1850s, uh, but it's supposed to show Washington, okay? And there's Washington astride his boat, uh, headed across the Delaware River. Behind him, you have uh, future President James Monroe holding the flag. You have all these guys rowing. Now, if you're thinking, is this an accurate image of what it was like? You know, not quite. Uh, I'd seriously doubt Washington was standing up on any kind of boat. It's a good way to fall into that icy water, okay? But he certainly did lead his men in this uh, action that turned out to be one of the few bright spots in the early war. Now, around this same time, there are other actions going on by other Americans, not in the military theater, but in a the diplomatic theater. And particularly two of the guys, and we've already talked about them, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson are sent to France to go and try and negotiate with, uh, uh, with the king, uh, King uh, Louis XVI, an alliance with the French. Now, we find that, generally speaking, the French government was on board with the revolution for really no other reason than they liked the idea of the British losing some of their colonies. But the French are kind of worried because they don't want to get involved with this war if it's definitely going to be a losing proposition for them, okay? Because it's going to cost them money and it's going to bring them into full-on war with the British, which they just got out of uh, just a, a decade uh, or so before. Now, after 1777, though, that changes due to a pivotal American victory at the Battle of Saratoga over the British. Now, at the court, uh, the court of King Louis, we see that uh, Jefferson is, is liked, but really the superstar is Ben Franklin. There's Ben Franklin hanging out with the ladies. He was apparently a very, a very popular uh, 
with the French ladies at the time. Uh, he was uh, kind of played up his role as the American, and so he'd wear like you know fur hats everywhere he went because that's kind of what the French expected an American to look like. So Franklin was kind of playing a role a little bit. Ultimately, it's pretty successful, and his help is able to get uh, the French king, King Louis, on board with helping the Americans in this fight. Now, this Battle of Saratoga, okay, again, again happens in uh, 1777, and it's considered to be the turning point of the American Revolution. Why? Well, because an American force uh, is able to defeat a much superior uh, British army uh, headed down from uh, Canada. Now, the British army under General Borgoyne, uh, John Borgoyne, he is not really so smart because he ends up heading his troops right through the woods of southern Canada to try to get to uh, Americans in New York State, uh, in upstate New York, and is met instead by uh, American troops under General uh, Gates, who is able to, again, use kind of the, the territory of the area, particularly kind of ridge lines that were allowed them to kind of surround the, the, front, uh, the British and end up routing them in this battle. And the thing is, is that after the Americans win this all by themselves, it gives an indication to the French that, hey, maybe this is not a losing battle. Maybe if we throw our weight behind these Americans, they can actually win this war. So again, it's this battle in 1777 that really tries to turn the tide in the Americans' favor, especially because of the help of the French. Now we see some particular folks come in. Uh, one Frenchman that we do need to focus on is this guy, the Marquis de Lafayette. Now Lafayette was um, a big supporter of Americans. He, he was a big fan of America before the revolution even occurred. And so when it broke out, he was one of the first Frenchmen pushing for French intervention to help the Americans. Uh, he actually ended up coming over to America early despite uh, what the king wanted to help out, uh, but eventually, once the French join, he is formally going to help and join the war effort. Uh, he will be kind of a lieutenant under George Washington, uh, and so he will help uh, Washington train troops while the French Navy will start getting together to go out and start fighting the British on the high seas, which will start to make it where uh, supplies can start to get into the colonies a little bit easier. So by the time that French troops actually land in the spring of 1778, things are looking pretty good for the Americans. They haven't won yet, but things are on are looking up. But there's one other little hiccup in between that Washington has to get his men through. Over the winter of 1777 to 78, uh, the the Troops are headed for their winter quarters. At this time in history, wars rarely happened during the winter because it was so cold and it was hard to move. Troops in a time where you had to have everybody on wagons and all your cannons had to be pulled by horses. So generally speaking, for wintertime, not a lot of battles happened. So you tried to find a place to hang out and prepare for the spring. And so Washington took his men to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, kind of a very isolated, hard-to-get-to area of Pennsylvania that was generally pretty safe from the British. Uh, but at Valley Forge, he has to deal with a bitter winter where it's very, very cold. Again, there's not a lot of food, and there's a huge smallpox, smallpox outbreak at Valley Forge that really kind of tests whether the, the Continental Army will continue on. But... Washington, along with Lafayette, and another guy, Baron von Steuben, who was a German officer who came over to help fight with Washington, who had been trained in some of the, the most uh, powerful Prussian armies, a uh, German, a German uh, state. Um, and so he used his, his kind of knowledge of drill to drill the soldiers and kind of get them into line and get them into shape. And these guys were able to do it over this winter and kept the Continental Army together despite all of their disadvantages. Okay, and then when spring came in 1778 and the French, uh, the French show up with additional troops to help, things are really starting to go in the Americans' favor. 
But again, it was really touch and go. Definitely some starvation, near starvation at Valley Forge. Um, and uh, it didn't look good, right? And Washington was really concerned. There are a lot of letters writing to the Continental Congress saying, hey, I don't know if we're going to make it, but somehow they did. Now, von Steuben, again, he was the one who kind of worked on professionalizing the soldiers and kind of, uh, kind of training them, okay, into how to march, how to stay in formation. Steuben, though, he really had a tough time of it because he was used to working with the Prussian soldiers who were kind of trained to listen to their, their officers and do whatever their officers say. But he found the Continental Army was a lot different, that the Americans... They generally would do what he said, but only if he explained himself why they were doing it, which really made him mad. Um, and in fact, there were some stories about how, like, when they were, he was training them, sometimes the soldiers would intentionally, like, do the wrong thing because they knew he would freak out, and generally he would start cussing in German, and they'd all laugh at him, and they thought it was funny, okay? Now, Lafayette, he worked a little bit more behind the scenes, kind of, you know, making sure that uh, uniforms were kind of standardized and that, you know, the training was standardized and kind of acted as a kind of right-hand man to Washington during this war. Now we're going to kind of fast forward, and through 1778 to 1781, we're seeing that no one side is actually having any decisive battles, okay? But... The war finally did come to a conclusion at the Battle of Yorktown, okay? Now, Yorktown um, is in Virginia. By this time, the British Army had kind of come to the south to try to cut off access between the northern and southern colonies. But the British Army kind of got trapped at Yorktown. Yorktown is on a peninsula uh, off the Chesapeake Bay, and so... Yorktown goes right up to the bay, and then surrounding it is a peninsula of land that, if you can get around it, you can kind of surround Yorktown on all sides. And that's exactly what the Americans did. The Americans and their French allies surrounded the British, and then pivotally, the, uh, pivotally, the French army, or the French navy, rather, blockaded the port. So... The general in charge there, General Cornwallis, uh, they uh, kept anyone from, uh, uh, they, they had two options. They could either go out and fight and probably lose and die or surrender. Okay? So, they surrendered. And this was the last major Redcoat army left in the colonies. And so once Cornwallis and his men surrendered to Washington, that was it. The war, at least the fighting part of the war, was over. And so this surrender was considered and called the, time, the day the world turned upside down. Because now, presumably, a colony of a European power has now become independent. No one thought that could happen. And now it has. Now... The thing is, though, is that that doesn't actually end the war. It's actually the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Now, if you're remembering from a couple of videos ago, you're like, oh, wow, that sounds familiar. Well, yeah, there's a Treaty of Paris, 1763 as well. That ends the French and Indian War. But this one, the Treaty of Paris, 1783, ends the American Revolution. Now, it does take a couple of years to work out, but the, this will formally end the American Revolution, thereby giving America full independence. Okay, so now they're an independent country and they can do their own thing. It gives the Americans all the territory east of the Mississippi River between Canada and Florida. So Canada is still part of Britain. And then Florida is now going to go back to Spanish control. And it is supposed to lead to the removal of all the rest of the British Army from those claims in America. And so now what you're looking at here is... Uh, uh, the North America after the Treaty of Paris, 1763. Of course, the British won that war, getting rid of most of the French claims in North America. But this is after this treaty, the Treaty of Paris, 1783. So this area you have here in this kind of tan color um, is the new United States of America, okay? Uh, green being Spanish Louisiana, 
and this blue, uh, this pink up here are the still controlled areas of British North America that would eventually become the state of Canada. Now we see that the American Revolution though is also something that inspires other revolutions elsewhere. We see that uh, debt is a pretty common problem. Uh, the uh, problem of debt kind of leads to several other revolutions, most notably the French Revolution, because the French helped us win this war. They take out huge debts to try and win the war. And hey, it works, but then guess what? They had to pay those debts. And then when uh, the economic situation gets bad in France, they decide, hey, we're going to have our own revolution. And it gets even more spicy than ours, okay? We see that in Latin America, very similar movements against the Spanish Empire will occur at, beginning in the early 1800s. And that had a lot to do with economic causes as well, as like the lower classes worked very, very hard, pretty much just to the benefit of the Spanish Empire. And eventually they get tired of that. Taxes also are a big thing, okay? The raising of taxes um, in both the French and the uh, Latin American revolutions are kind of part of the thing that kind of leads them to occur. And then the Enlightenment ideas are also a big idea, okay? That these ideas of liberty and equality, they are touchstones of the French Revolution, and many of them are actually uh, like directly connected to the story of the American Revolution. They say, listen, they're, they're acting out their natural rights here. What about here in France? And very similarly in Latin America, you have uh, educated uh, folks of, you know, kind of mixed background. Uh, so both colonial or, and Spanish, so we call these like Creole folks, uh, spreading Enlightenment ideas there that also kind of say we should have our natural rights and freedom. Okay, so the American Revolution in many ways kind of is mirrored in these other revolutions yet to come. But that's it for now, and next time we're, we'll start Unit 3 and start talking about what this new country is actually going to look like. But we'll save that for later. See you next time.